All right, welcome to ECE 165. This is lecture 10, where we will be discussing variation in digital VLSI systems. And then the main topic of today's lecture is how to do automated design. This is a really interesting possibility for us. We've spent a lot of time in this course talking about how to do manual design by hand. We've done manual layout now in lab three, depending on when you're watching this video. And you'll see that it's very time consuming, especially to do well. Um, it turns out that there's a suite of tools that allow us to do effectively most of what we've already done, but in a totally automated way. So what I mean by that is instead of drawing digital circuits uh, by the transistor level and then laying them out at the transistor level, what we can do is write some hardware description language code, something like Verilog or VHDL, put it into a synthesis script, press enter, and out pops a schematic, and then put it into a place and route tool, press enter and out pops a layout. Wouldn't this be convenient? Uh, and indeed, this is how most high complexity digital design is done. Now, what we're going to learn in this course is, is, or in this lecture rather, is how to do this at least at a high level. And then lab four, uh, which is kind of a uh, half between a lab and half a tutorial, is really gonna teach you how to do this uh, with actual industry standard tools. Okay, now with all of that being said, we should keep in mind that although the automated tools are extremely good, they aren't always as good as a very good human designer. Uh, and so we will actually explore this particular aspect of automated design a little bit later on in this course. So what we mean by variation is that when we send our circuits or when rather when we design our circuits and then send them to the fab and then get them back and test them, they may not have exactly the same performance that you would ideally expect from simulation. And this makes sense, you know, fabrication procedures have uh, variable tolerances. And, and of course, if you specify something to be 49.9999 nanometers wide, well, the likelihood of it being exactly that wide is very low. And in reality, there's some distribution of possible uh, sizes depending on the tolerances of the manufacturing. You can think of this, you know, when you buy a resistor from DigiKey, it's usually you know, some resistance plus or minus 5% or plus or minus 10% or something like this, okay? So that's really what we mean by variation. Now, if you'd want to learn a little bit more about variation, I suggest that you uh, uh, take a look at um, section uh, 7.2 in the Weston Harris book. It's a very good resource for this, okay? But what we really mean, and we're gonna cover this a little bit in this lecture, is there's three different categories of variation we're going to concern ourselves with. The first is process variation. And again, this is when you design your transistor and you expect a certain threshold voltage, you expect a certain W over L, a certain mobility, uh, you expect certain uh, dimensions of wires that connect your transistors together. Um, and when you get it back from the foundry, those values may not be exactly what uh, you would uh, ideally think. Okay, so that may affect how your circuit actually works. So let me just write a note here uh, uh, for, for completeness in your notes. All of this results in circuits that may not work uh, exactly as your ideal simulations. Now, in some extreme cases, particularly if you, if you haven't really thought about variation uh, along your, your design methodology, this may prevent, this prevents circuits from working at all. Okay. So obviously variation is, is therefore important and we as digital designers really ought to pay very close attention to variation to make sure that uh, when we get our circuits back, even if you know, we have our expected tolerances of plus or minus 10% or, or whatever it happens to be, that our circuit will still work. So that's what we would call process variation. There's also variation from the environment, um, which is not really anything to do with process, but you know, you, you design your circuit and uh, you can't control the, to the designer if they're uh, working or using your circuit in uh, you know, sub-freezing temperatures or if they're 
in the, the desert in the summer. Um, you know, the temperature of the circuit is something that does vary and it's not really up to the control of the designer. And so as a result, we call this variation and, and we as designers have to account for it in our digital designs. In addition, something like voltage, the supply voltage of your circuit can vary. You know, a DC-DC converter generates that supply voltage, but DC-DC converters are not perfect. They generate a supply voltage that's within, say, some tolerance, plus or minus 10%, and there's usually some high-frequency ripple on top of that supply voltage. Um, so that is some variation that we also have to take into account when we design our circuits. The third class of variation is what we'd call aging or wear out. Uh, we'll talk about this a little bit, uh, but did, you know, digital circuits, uh, if there's a lot of current flowing through them for a lot of time, uh, you know, their resistances of the traces and of the transistors may indeed change over time. So one point I'd just like to make here is that variation is becoming more and more important in scaled CMOS technologies. So as we shrink our gate lengths, uh, as our threshold voltages become lower, it's getting harder and harder for us to control at a manufacturing, from a manufacturing perspective, um, the precise values of all of these components. And as a result, their relative change relative to the absolute value uh, can uh, start to increase as, as we decrease in these, in, these, in these scaled CMOS technologies. So variation is something that is becoming increasingly important for us as digital designers to really be aware of. Now one other thing I'd like to point out here is that we often just lump process variation in, into a single uh, unit, although as we'll see in the next few slides here, there are many forms of process variation. And we're also very interested in voltage variation and temperature variation. So what you'll often hear people refer to is called PVT variation, and that's nothing more than just process, voltage, and temperature variation. So you as a digital designer need to make sure that your circuit is robust under process, voltage, and temperature variation. So let's talk about process variation at first. You know, we talked about things like threshold voltage. Um, you know, this really depends on, um, you know, the absolute placement of dopants in, in your channel. And, um, you know, that changes with manufacturing. It's very hard to very precisely control that. Uh, and in fact, the uh, distribution of this is inversely proportional to the channel area. So if we have a very large channel, then that means we can control this a little bit better. And as a result, we'll get lower variation on our circuits. So that's one thing to point out. If we want lower variation on our circuits, we can design big circuits and, and, and that certainly does help. Now, threshold variation is, is particularly important um, when we start dealing with low power, uh, particularly sub-threshold uh, transistors, where we have that exponential dependence on the threshold voltage. So if the threshold voltage changes by even small amount, that can result in an exponential change in, say, our leakage current or our uh, drive strength and therefore our operational speed. So threshold voltage variation is actually extremely important. Now we also get uh, variation in terms of channel length. You can see some pictures here. You know, this is a standard layout that, uh, that uh, one would expect. And you can see here that there's some rounded lines. You know, we don't really draw rounded lines when we lay out our circuits in cadence. They're always uh, rectangular uh, polygons uh, that we uh, create our circuits in. But, you know, of course, when we actually manufacture these devices, it doesn't quite come out so nicely. Uh, same exact story happens on interconnect, uh, you know, depending on how the interconnect is actually fabricated, we can get some variation in the width, the height, and the length uh, of these types of uh, interconnects here. So, so it's important for us as digital designers to at least be aware of this. So this is kind of the basis for process variation. Process variation manifests itself in a few different ways. So let's take a look at that. So we can say that uh, if we look at, uh, at process variation in the context of an entire wafer, we can get a bunch of different classes of variation uh, on that wafer. We can get lot-to-lot -lot variation, which means that you know, some uh, lot of uh, wafers, uh, a collection of wafers, have different properties than a different collection of wafers, and maybe that's depending on who set up that machine that particular day that does some sort of chemical processing. 
Um, we can get wafer to wafer variation. You know, one wafer that's manufactured right after the other wafer might have a slightly different calibration routine that was done on the manufacturing equipment, and therefore that wafer has slightly different parameters. Across the wafer, we can get uh, distribution, so we call that dye to dye uh, variation. Um, and then we can get even finer grain within dye variation. You can have even two transistors that are laid out right next to each other, and they could potentially have some variation between them and with slightly different, say, threshold voltages, for example. Now, in general, uh, this is a general trend. The closer devices are together, the less variation between them you would expect. Uh, so, a, a, you know, a transistor right next to another transistor should be matched a little bit better than a transistor on one side of the chip next to an, or, or compared to a transistor on the other side of the chip, which would then further be better matched from one transistor on one side of the wafer to another transistor on the other side of the wafer or from one wafer to the next. Okay, so that's just a general trend uh, that we can observe. Let's talk about environmental variation. Um, so like I said, uh, the supply voltage of a chip is generally generated by a DC-DC converter. Um, and the output voltage of that DC-DC converter is usually only accurate to within plus or minus 5 or 10 percent. And there's usually some sort of uh, uh, ripple associated with that, with that uh, waveform. You know, you have your, your VDD. It should ideally be flat, but in practice, you know, there's, uh, there's a little bit of noise on there. and There's some variation. In addition, so we would call that VDD uh, of T plotted versus T. In addition, DC-DC converters are not perfect. So if we have some sort of constant load, let's, let's say this is our, our, our load uh, current versus time, and we're at some constant load, and then all of a sudden we get a huge increase in our current load. Well, there's some sort of feedback circuit that uh, determines how that DC-DC converter is operating, and what might end up happening is you get this uh, waveform that's you know noisy and stuff and when that load happens it's gonna that voltage is gonna droop and then eventually it'll come back up and and, and uh, fix itself uh, due to its internal feedback loop but that voltage droop could potentially be very large now when that voltage droops we want to make sure that our circuits are still actually working um, and so as a result we have to make sure that our, our, our circuits are robust and work properly and meet all of our timing constraints and and, and uh, um, delay constraints even under these drooped voltage conditions. So it turns out that that's very challenging, but we as digital designers have to be aware of that. The next environmental variation is temperature. Um, temperature can and will change uh, across your chip uh, or even within your chip from one corner to the next. Let's say you have a, a microprocessor and it's uh, you know some decoding some H.264 or MPEG video or something and it has to have a lot of processing capabilities to, to run that. Um, so that particular core might be a lot hotter than some of the other cores. Uh, so as a result, you have to be aware of that as a digital designer. Make sure that your circuits are robust when the temperature goes up or goes down. Now, there's some standard uh, temperature ranges that uh, we as designers typically uh, try to achieve. Uh, the commercial temperature range usually ranges from 0 to 70 degrees Celsius, industrial from minus 40 to 85 Celsius, and the military range, very strict, very, very difficult to, to deal with, minus 55 C to 125 C. Um, and so usually when you design a product, uh, you will spec what type of uh, standard temperature range is achievable uh, in your chip. So let's take a look back at uh, parameter variation. And, and as we said, uh, when we fabricate our transistors, they may come back with slightly different lengths, threshold voltages, oxide thickness, and things like that. Um, and they may be different between NMOS and PMOS devices. So what we like to say uh, as convention in integrated circuit design is that the mean is what we would call our typical corner. Okay, so, so, so we, we, we get some uh, device back or we get a collection of devices back and the mean will be in our typical corner. That's typically what our uh, simulators are set up to simulate is the typical corner. Now let's say we get an NMOS device back and it's a little faster than we would nominally expect. It's faster than the mean device. Well, that could mean that the length of the device was a little shorter than normal. Our W over L ratio was larger than, than what we would otherwise predict. Our threshold voltage was perhaps a little lower than normal, 
uh, through random dopant fluctuations or something like this. And therefore, we can turn on our device much harder and therefore it can run faster. And perhaps maybe our oxide was a little thinner, uh, which allows us to have better control over the channel and invert it more rapidly. And therefore, we can deliver more current through our device. So if that happened, we would say that we would be in the fast corner. Now, if the opposite of these things happened, we'd say we were in the slow corner. Now, what we like to do as digital or, or integrated circuit designers is we like to set up a map um, that looks something like this. So we have our, our typical corner uh, right in the middle. I don't know why they call it a corner, but, uh, but nevertheless. And then we say um, the first letter here corresponds to the NMOS. The second letter corresponds to the PMOS. So if, we're, if we are in the FF corner, then that means both our NMOS and our PMOS devices in the area that, that we're looking at here are faster than normal. In the slow, slow corner, uh, same thing. Uh, in the SF corner, that means that our NMOS is slower than normal, our PMOS is a little faster than normal. Now this is going to be very useful uh, for kind of broad stroke variation analysis. Um, the foundry uh, manufacturers will come up with some distributions and then they will assign what these actual corner values are. And so you can take these corner values and in cadence you can say, well, don't simulate in, in the typical, typical corner. Let's simulate in the FF corner. Uh, and therefore it will sign slightly faster NMOS and PMOS devices. And then you as a designer make sure that your circuit still works even under this variation. Now, not all par parameters are independent uh, for both NMOS and PMOS. So sometimes uh, th there's some um, interaction amongst these. Now we can look again at environmental variation and again we can corner analysis this so if a fast corner in VDD would mean that VDD is a little higher than normal. A fast corner in temperature, this is actually a slightly tricky one. Um, let's just think, do, do we think it's high or low? Higher temperature or lower temperature would be better. Well what I'm going to say actually is I'm going to say that uh, a faster device is going to operate at low temperature. And that kind of, uh, you know, makes sense. We know that uh, conductors and, and, and resistors and stuff uh, have slightly less resistance at lower temperature, therefore they conduct a little bit better. Um, but that's not always the case, particularly when it comes to subthreshold transistors. And we'll understand that a little bit more momentarily. So a fast corner in terms of voltage, uh, nominally we might say in, in, in a, some process that we have, and nominally have a 1.8 volt uh, uh, device. Maybe we can say that, uh, well, the fast corner might have some 10% higher voltage there. The slow corner might be 10% lower voltage. And temperature, let's say we're, we're operating over um, you know, some um, interesting range. Maybe that's 0 degrees C to 125 degrees C from the fast to slow corners, respectively. Okay, so then what we like to do is, uh, what we've described here as corner analysis, what we'd like to do is generate some global process corners. So that's what we say here. We have global process corners. So this really describes what would be some sort of worst case uh, variation. Now, of course, variation is by definition a statistical distribution. So worst case is that one sigma, is that three sigma, is that six sigma. That's kind of up to the manufacturers and, and, and what type of confidence they have in, in, in their manufacturing capability. Um, but as designers, we usually kind of trust what the manufacturers tell us. And if our circuits run amongst all of these corners, then we have a pretty clear uh, idea or we have a lot of confidence that our circuit is actually going to work here. Okay, so uh, what we can often do, we can often, depending on the PDK, but this is the tr true for almost all PDKs these days, is simulate global process corners, that is TT, SS, FF, SF, and FS, in Spectre or H spice in cadence. And I believe our 45 nanometer PDK that we're using in this class indeed supports uh, this type of variation analysis. So let's take a look at a few examples where this might become important. So let's say that we are very interested in making sure that our circuit meets some cycle time uh, uh, spec. So, so our, our boss says, well, we need to have some certain 
uh, frequency, clock frequency that we need to hit. Uh, what corner do we want to uh, measure or do we want to stimulate our circuit in to make sure that even under the worst case, we're going to hit our cycle time spec? Well, for the NMOS, typically that means we want to operate in the slow corner. If the, if the NMOS is slower and it still meets the cycle time spec, then we should be good. Similar thing with the PMOS, uh, VDD, also we want to be in the slow corner. If we're at slightly lower than normal VDD, uh, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll be operating correctly. And temperature also in the slow corner. Now for power, it's typically the opposite. We typically want to look at the fast corners because that's when uh, you know, VTs are a little lower. Or that means we have a, a little higher leakage power. Um, we have um, uh, you know, more uh, shoot through current and, and, and things like this. So, so I, I think uh, for, for power purposes, looking at the fast corner makes a lot of sense. For leakage, it's a little bit different. Um, so typically for leakage, we do indeed want to look at the fast corner for the NMOS and the PMOS, and also for, for VDD, actually. Uh, we'd like to look at the um, uh, fast corner, that is, we have slightly higher VDD than we would nominally have, and that implies that we're going to have a little bit worse uh, leakage power uh, due to Dibble and other effects like this. Now the final one is temperature. And it turns out that uh, just simply because leakage or subthreshold conduction is a process of diffusion as opposed to drift, drift is the, the, the mechanism of current conduction in above threshold transistors and resistors and things like this, and that has a certain temperature uh, profile, but diffusion actually works oppositely with temperature. So actually for subthreshold leak leakage, we typically like to operate in the slow corner in order to have a kind of a worst case uh, prediction of what that leakage current might be. Now this variation is very complicated and, and the corner analysis is generally useful for an entire chip worth of variation. So kind of chip to chip or perhaps even wafer to wafer type of variation. But what about the variation between two transistors that are right next to each other? How do we really take that into account? Well, there's a nice technique called Monte Carlo simulation. And what this really does is, is it, uh, it's a collection of simulations. Let's say we have some sort of pipeline circuit or some sort of adder uh, that needs to meet a timing specification. Well, what we would do is we would make a simulation. We would find out what the uh, you know, nominal uh, a time for uh, uh, it to complete its simulation is. And then what we do is we go ahead and we randomly change the threshold voltage, the mobility, the, the length of, of all of the transistors in the circuit according to some random distribution and rerun that simulation. And you do this hundreds or thousands of times and when you do that you kind of get these nice statistical plots of the distribution of the expected values that, that, that you're looking for. You know, what is the distribution of say your cycle time. And even if in the worst case, according to this uh, statistical analysis, your cycle time is still okay, then yeah, you, you can have some high confidence that your design will actually work. Um, so Monte Carlo analysis can be uh, useful for analysis of local variation. This would be on top of global corners. Okay, so let's switch gears a little bit and let's talk about digital design automation, which is what we alluded to at the start of this lecture and what we're really going to be doing in lab four in this class. Now, if we take a look at some, uh, a little bit older now, but some historical data, we can say that uh, over the years, the number of transistors that we put on a chip are growing at an alarmingly high rate. Uh, in, in this particular graph, we're, we're growing with complexity at something like 58% per year. Now, on the other hand, the number of people that we're actually employing um, to, to make these chips is not growing, growing nearly at the same rate. Um, if we were doing full manual design, we'd probably have to grow that at approximately the same rate. But today, there exists a fairly large gap between the number of transistors or logic gates per chip and uh, the transistors per you know, unit of staff month or, or, or something like this. So there's a gap that we as designers really need to meet. Uh, and we can address this with design automation.
So computers are very good at doing things in kind of regular patterns. We write some code and, and they can understand it and they can do things very quickly, much faster than humans can. Uh, and so we really would try to like to leverage this in order to increase our productivity as digital designers. So we can take a look at an example, say system on chip. Uh, this is some sort of processor from, from Philips. Uh, it, it has a, a CPU on it. It has a video a coprocessor, which does some video decoding or encoding. It has uh, some uh, hardware that uh, generates audio out and digital audio out and things like this. There's a lot of very complex functionality on this chip. Um, and we really need to leverage what computers are very good at, and, and that's building regular structures and following instructions uh, written by, by in code uh, in order to really bring a lot of these blocks together. If we have to design manually each one of these blocks, it's going to take us a very long time, and uh, the rate of progression uh, is not going to be uh, satisfying, at least from our customer's uh, perspective. So. We can take a look at some different uh, implementation choices. So l let's say we have some function that we need to implement. L let's say for, for the purposes of this example, we want to decode a video. Okay, So we can do that in a number of different ways. We can use a microprocessor to decode this video. A microprocessor is totally general purpose. It can run any type of code, and it can certainly decode any type of video that we throw at it if we give it the right program. But it's a very general purpose device, and we usually trade off uh, the ability to be general with other important metrics like either power or performance. Okay, So th that's often a fundamental trade off. The more general we make something, um, the more power or, or the less performance it's going to have in comparison to alternative approaches. So let's say we want to decode this video. Well, there's another way we could do it. We could build some sort of digital signal processor that has much more customizable functions, or maybe this is some sort of graphical processor, or GPU, something like this. Uh, and this could be a little bit better, but we can, we can do better. Maybe in, in the next case, we'll go to something like an FPGA um, that we can you know, kind of more customize our, our hardware uh, to exactly what we need. Or we can just design a chip that does exclusively decoding video. Um, and if we do that, probably we're going to get the best energy efficiency or the best performance or both. Okay, Because this is a piece of hardware that's designed from the ground up to do that very specific function. Now that's really kind of what we're, what we're focusing on here is this kind of full custom design, but we want to be able to make it such that we don't have to lay out every single gate manually and connect them all together. It just takes way too long. So what we're going to introduce is a design methodology that will help us do that much more quickly. So our design methodology is uh, really kind of breaking apart some levels of abstraction. Um, so what we really want to get to in the end is some sort of layout. We want to send our layout to uh, the manufacturer to build our chip. Now to get to layout, we generally have to design you know, some gates or some schematics. You know how the gates are connected and, and, and things like that. But you know this, the whole point of this is we don't want to have to go there and, and, and manually design all of these gates and schematics and then create our layout. So what we'd like to do is we'd like to write a program. We, we'd like to write some sort of script uh, or some sort of uh, code that defines what function we'd like to implement. Uh, oftentimes we, we, we write this in something like Verilog or some sort of HDL. HDL stands for Hardware Description Language. If you want to learn more about this, ECE 111 is a, is a good introductory uh, uh, course that describes uh, these hardware description languages in a little bit more detail. And what this does is, is, is this is really representing the behavior of the chip. We can start with a very simple example. Let's say we want to add two numbers. Well, we know how to code adding two numbers, y equals a plus b. That's pretty straightforward. So what we'd like to do is build some sort of software infrastructure where it can say, it can see y is equal to a plus b. Oh, that's an adder. Uh, and typically, the designer will specify what bit widths and, and things like this are available. And our software stack will say, oh, this is an adder. Let me translate that into a network of gates that represent the Boolean structure that I think you're implying there. And then once I have these gates, I can then go ahead and automate some sort of layout for you. Okay, So if we can do this, this would be a very powerful design methodology. And that's exactly what we're going to introduce today.
So we can take a look at this. Um, you know, we've been really focusing on, on custom uh, design uh, of digital integrated circuits. This is what we've been doing. And uh, there's semi-custom. This is more like uh, FPGAs and gate arrays and, and, and things like that. We're not really going to discuss that in this course. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to, rather than just do full custom design, we're going to go the semi-custom route, uh, but this time we're going to go the cell-based route. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to define some standard cells that we're going to use, and we're going to compile them into much larger uh, designs. So this is what we will do in lab four. Okay, very good. So the custom approach is really what uh, you know, you're, you're all familiar with. This is what our original microprocessors were designed as. And uh, as we start to scale up the complexity of these processors, you'll see this gets very unwieldy quickly. So here's the original Intel 4004 uh, and 1971. And you can kind of almost, if you zoom in close enough, you can even see some of the transistors and the, and, and, and the connections between them. And, and there's some regular patterns there, but a lot of it is, is, is a little irregular. Then you start to scale up to the 8080 and, and much larger processors, and you can see very regular patterns. Um, and by the time you get to some of our x86 processors, I mean, it's just it's just you know so difficult to 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 really be able to as a team of engineers design this completely manually. So we really have to leverage this uh, automated approach, and that's what we're going to talk about now. So in this automated approach, we like to do it using cell-based design. What that means is we have some sort of a collection of what we call standard cells. And standard cells are nothing more than a collection of inverters, NAND gates, flip-flops, uh, you know, XOR gates, and, and, and things like this. And they're all sized to have the same height. Some of them might have variable widths, but usually they have the same height. Uh, and so therefore, when we, when we say to our uh, software stack, I want to implement Y equals A plus B, the software will say, well, I know, I know what addition means, so therefore I'm going to synthesize a collection of gates. Let me go ahead and place these gates in some sort of logically consistent manner. So, um, you know, I have an AND gate and then an XOR gate or, or whatever the combination may be. Um, let me place them next to each other and let me um, uh, give myself a little bit of space to do routing and then I'll connect them all together. And then in the corner, maybe we have some other functional units, some SRAM or, or, or some uh, IP blocks. We'll talk about that a little bit more. So we can see what does the standard cell methodology actually look like. So this is a good example. This is a slide where you can see there's rows of logic and then there's a bunch of wires connecting all these different rows of logic. So this is you know, a little older now, 1992, uh, but this is really forms the basis of how we do uh, standard cell design even in the modern generation. So we can step forward a few generations and see what this looks like in, in a more modern way. Here's a, a picture of a, a standard cell design. Uh, and you can see, you know, there's some regularity here. We have uh, very thin horizontal lines that represents the standard cell rows. Uh, and then we have thicker vertical lines that actually represent some, some, some power grids that uh, we'll talk about momentarily. So let's talk about the standard cells themselves. This is a, a, an example of a standard cell uh, courtesy of uh, SD Microelectronics. Um, and this is nothing more than, than a three input NAND gate. And you should actually be able to look at this uh, design here and immediately realize uh, that, hey, yes, this is indeed a three input NAND gate. So what we typically like to do is once we've designed our standard cell, and, and by the way, we usually like to try and make our standard cell as small as possible because it's going to be replicated many times across the chip. So we really want to be area efficient. So you can see they do a few tricks here with the uh, uh, making the poly change uh, uh, directions here a little bit. In some uh, more modern PDKs, that's simply not allowed. Um, but in this particular PDK, it was. And then what we do is, is we will characterize the timing, uh, the propagation delay of the circuit across many different types of input uh, um, um, vector sets as well as different temperature and voltage and, and a few different types of variation. And the reason we build up all these tables is then what we can say is, is, is our tools will take this cell and it can say, well, I know exactly, um, you know, based on the uh, uh, amount of, uh, uh, or rather the input vector, I know what the delay approximately is going to be through the cell. And so therefore, I will know what the delay is through the NAND gate, which then drives an inverter, XOR, et cetera, et cetera. I know the delay through the whole path. 
Okay, so generating this information is very important in this standard cell design methodology. So if you want to go ahead and build a standard cell, we can follow a few steps. Generally, we start with some initial transistor geometries, or, or actually usually what we start out with is, is the DDD and ground lines, uh, because they are a, a fixed or standard uh, a height uh, apart from each other. Then we put in our transistors, uh, we route internally in the cell, we make sure everything's nice and small, and then we, we apply our, our end wells and everything like this to, to, to make sure that uh, we can take one of these standard cells and exactly abut it with another standard cell and the end wells will overlap and, and the, the VDD and the ground lines will automatically connect together. So what do we mean by that? Well, this is kind of what we mean by that. We take these inverters, we kind of abut them and they all kind of connect automatically. All the end wells are connected, VDDs and grounds are connected. What we often do is we like to uh, mirror our circuits or we'll mirror to share uh, power uh, rails and end wells. So this just saves a little bit of space. Uh, you know, basically our, our top circuit is mirrored down to our lower circuit, and that way we can have a thicker uh, ground trace. Uh, and then the, the next circuit is again mirrored, and, and therefore our VDG traces are shared as well as our um, N wells. Uh, so this is a, a nice compact way to do it. Now when we take a look at our, our layout, uh, we typically will provide the tool that's going to do our automatic place and, and routing of these standard cells with some guidelines. Okay, uh, And these guidelines are, are typically um, such that we make routing much easier and also minimize some capacitance. So one of the guidelines that we like to enforce is that we like to make sure that immediately adjacent metal layers, that is say metal 1 to metal 2 or metal 2 to metal 3, are routed in uh, orthogonal directions. So we can see here that uh, M1 is being routed in the, in the horizontal domain, whereas M2 is being routed in the vertical domain. And the reason we like to do that is because, you know, there's going to be some overlap in these two metal lines, and that's going to cause some parasitic capacitance. And if we guarantee that M1 is always orthogonal to M2, then that overlap is going to be fairly minimal. Okay, and so this allows us to make very regular uh, layout structures while enabling uh, minimum uh, wiring parasitic. So in addition, once we've placed our standard cells, we need to wire up uh, power and ground to them. So what we typically like to do is build a ring of, of VDD and ground with some nice thick metal layers such that they have very low resistance. Uh, we put this all around our, our, our circuit here. Um, and then we bring that power into the circuit. And oftentimes what we like to do is we like to add a little bit extra, what we call uh, strips, um, and then we, we via down to make sure that we're connected in the right place. So let's say this is a ground strip. Well, we have a couple of vias here. Uh, ground is uh, on the top here, a couple of vias. Um, and then what we'd do is, of course, we'd via down onto our ground terminals here, and that just gives us a little bit extra room for um, a nice low resistance connection uh, to VDD and ground across our layouts here. Okay, so we can do the same thing for VDD. Uh, put some contacts there or some vias, um, and so on and so forth to make sure that we have a nice design uh, to make sure that uh, our, our uh, power supply paths are very low resistance. Now this is what we would call a standard cell uh, design methodology, but sometimes you know, you know there, there are some circuits that aren't very amenable to standard cells. Something like a, a memory module, an SRAM, it's not really a standard cell, it's, it's really just a whole SRAM. Uh, and so what we can do is we can actually build uh, what we call hard macro module generators, which just say, okay, I want an SRAM of 256 by 32 bits, um, and you can run through some scripts, and out will actually pop a what we call a macro module that we can then place inside our layout, and if we, if we tell our tools where all the pins are and how to connect them, then it can wire that up all together. We can also look at things like soft macro modules, uh, and if you work in, in, and do uh, digital uh, automation in uh, processes that have support for this, 
then what what will happen is we'll say well you know let's say you know instead of y equals a plus b it's z equals a times b well that's a very you know common type of command that we'd like to implement um, and so what we can do is rather than have our standard cells try and implement this in, in a best case scenario we can have some kind of pre-cooked notions of how we want to actually build these multipliers and, and then the, the software will actually do this for you. So on, on a similar note, a, a big business in uh, integrated circuit design is what we call the IP business. Uh, and so this is the business where instead of you know uh, starting a company and actually fabricating chips, which is very expensive, what you can say is, well, I can sell you this block here. So I can sell you this block. So in other words, what that means is the company that's selling this block will have designed this in-house and, and presumably they'll have simulated it and, and hopefully tested it with some other customer or something like this. And they'll say, you can buy this for us. Uh, we will give you uh, kind of a black boxed uh, layout of this and you can insert it directly into your design and we guarantee it meets these specifications. So there's a lot of companies out there, particularly startup companies that are starting to do this. Um, and uh, it can potentially be a very lucrative business without having to go all the way through and actually building chips and selling them to customers and, 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 and things like this. So how do we go about actually doing this sort of design methodology? What we, would, what we typically do is we start with some sort of behavioral description of what we're trying to do. You know, we write some sort of Verilog code. Um, we write some sort of Verilog code that, you know, y equals a plus b or some sort of finite state machine. Um, and then what we have to do is we will synthesize some sort of structural design. So, so, so our Verilog, uh, which is a hardware description language, will, will have some sort of uh, description of what the function should be. And then our synthesizer will take that function and synthesize a network of gates that get connected together. Okay. Once that happens, then we have to do some sort of simulation. We use tools, something like model sim. Again, those of you who have taken EC111 might be a little bit more familiar with this. Uh, if you want to learn more, uh, you know, we're going to go through this through lab four, at least very briefly. And then the series of courses, ECE 260A, uh, and then more importantly, B uh, and C will really start to talk about this in a very serious way. So getting back to this, once we have our, our kind of gate level description synthesized, then we can go ahead and do the physical placement. Um, and so our tools with, with the, the designer's help will start to floor plan. Where do we want to put you know, some of our blocks here? Let's start to place our standard cells and let's route everything together. Once we do that, out pops a layout. Um, and once that happens, that's usually very satisfying because then you can go ahead and change a little piece of your code and you can run your script again and you'll get a new layout based on that new version of your code. Now, of course, once you get your layout, you usually want to do circuit extraction, extract more parasitics, do some more simulation and then kind of feedback and, and maybe modify your floor plan or your placement or, or whatever happens. Once you're done with all your, all, all your routing, uh, then you're typically ready for tape out, which is when you send your design out to the manufacturer uh, to get fabricated. So there's a, there's a design closure problem uh, in the sense, uh, and we'll learn more about this when we learn about sequential circuits, but when we start to look at uh, building these uh, you know, in an automated fashion, well we have to make sure the computer is aware of what timing conditions we have on our system. Um, and if there are violations, it has to find a way to solve those violations or get rid of those violations such that we can actually still uh, uh, work uh, or our chip works to our specification. So it's usually some sort of iterative uh, heuristic approach to removing these timing violations uh, and uh, they, they can usually do a good job if you give it enough uh, room or e enough uh, slack in your timing uh, specifications. So so if we could summarize this, we, we typically go from some sort of hardware description language, we do physical synthesis, we netlist, place and route, optimize, replace and route, and then deliver our artwork or our final layout to the foundry. And sometimes we'll, along that process, we'll bring in our macro modules, uh, you know, this could be our analog, RF, or custom layouts uh, into the flow here. So what I'd like to do now is go over an example of an automated design that uh, I actually personally worked on. 
Uh, and this is a design where uh, we were looking to build a RF radio receiver. This was an ultra wideband RF radio receiver working at somewhere between three and a half and, and four and a half gigahertz. And we needed to implement some sort of digital baseband modem that did synchronization of this RF front end uh, in order to uh, properly decode incoming RF data. Now this digital baseband is fairly complicated and so to design this manually is, is, is very, very difficult. So we really wanted to leverage some design automation technology or, uh, techniques. Now also in this design, we we're very interested in reducing power. Uh, this was uh, actually for an interesting application which I will describe momentarily where power was extremely limited. So we chose to, to look at three different ways to try and reduce that power. First, we took a look at kind of the higher level. What type of algorithms are we actually trying to implement here? And are they well suited to implement on a CMOS chip? Well, it turned out that the, uh, the algorithm that we really wanted to implement was far too complicated, involved vessel functions and things like this. Not very feasible for a nice low power chip. So what we did is we did some architectural transforms to reduce the computational complexity while still you know, uh, being able to derive sufficient performance out of our system. And then what we did is, well, just doing that alone doesn't give enough uh, a power reduction, so we want to take a look at some architectural transforms. This is kind of what we've talked a little bit about in this class so far. We want to operate at a lower voltage, but we don't want to sacrifice performance, so we lower the voltage, but then we introduce some parallelism in order to make up for that re reduction in performance. Then we did a lot of data and clock gating uh, in order to reduce circuit activity factors and therefore dynamic power. So we can take a look at one of the blocks that uh, was actually implemented here. You can see here we have some multipliers, uh, a multiplier here, we have an adder followed by a, a sequential element. And, and again, we'll talk about some of these blocks a little bit more detail later. This is a multiply or multiply accumulate unit or a MAC that we like to call. We have a shifter and another adder here. Um, so I just wanted to give you a taste of some of the blocks that might go in here. So here's a, a photograph of the actual chip that was implemented. It was implemented in a 90 nanometer CMOS process. It operated at uh, 0 0.55 volts. You can see the digital baseband processors, this big uh, regular area on the top of the chip here. The RF front end uh, and the radio receiver is the, the, the section on the bottom here. And you can even see uh, basically what we've been talking about. These are the power stripes. So these are the thick metal lines that go and, and connect into the vertical power stripes uh, that uh, deliver our VDD and ground to all of our uh, standard cells in this circuit. So what we can see here is that uh, uh, we were able to do some voltage scaling. As we scale the supply voltage down, we were able to uh, reduce our energy uh, required per uh, synchronization uh, event, which is the, the function of the chip here. But of course, as we did that, it also decreased our clock frequency. So we just had to be aware of that. And, and we basically were able to voltage scale down to a point where our performance met our uh, uh, specification that we were looking for. So here's a measured power result, uh, and this really shows the effect of power, or rather clock gating. So if there were no clock gating in the circuit, then the power of the circuit would always be up here. Okay, but most of the time, a lot of what we're, a lot of the blocks in this circuit really don't need to be on and doing computation. Okay, and so as a result, we can gate the clock going to all these circuits, and as a result, we can save a massive amount of power, in this case, upwards of, of, of 22 times in power versus not doing any clock gating. So let me uh, finish this by taking a look at uh, what application we were really targeting this for. This happened to be targeted for what, what we call a cyborg insect type of project. Uh, and, and this is a this is a device where we, we really would like to uh, uh, outfit some sort of insect with a neural stimulator. So we can take a look at, at what we mean by this on, on this slide here, where we have some sort of transmitter, and that transmitter is going to send directional commands up, down, left, right, something like this, and it's going to get received by that ultra wideband modem uh, that's on this particular insect. In this case, it's a moth. Now those commands then get decoded and they interface with a neural stimulator that interfaces with the nervous system of the insect. And by sending very soft but, uh, but uh, electrical stimulation commands, 
we can try and bias the flight direction of this particular insect. Okay, and so what we're really trying to con what we're really trying to make here is a remote control insect or a cyborg drone, if if you will. Okay, so this was a, a an interesting project, and as you can imagine, the electronics that need to go on this are extremely volume, weight, and as a result, energy constrained. Uh, so that's why we spent all this effort trying to really reduce the energy of this particular circuit uh, of our ultra wideband receiver circuit. Okay, and by doing so, we were able to make the weight of our circuit low enough such that the moth could actually fly with this device on. So in the next slide, I'm going to show you a video of, of uh, this actually set up in action. So in this video here, you can see the moth is flying in, in, in this direction here. When the LED there turns on, uh, after a short physiologic time delay, uh, or rather, when the LED turns on, the moth is receiving stimulation packets. And after a short physiologic time delay, you'll see the moth ends up veering to the left here. Uh, so this is a totally wireless demonstration. Uh, there's no wires connected to that insect. Uh, and we were able to achieve wireless neural stimulation in order to alter the flight direction of this insect. Now, if you want to learn more about the uh, bioelectronic aspect of this work, um, I do encourage you to take ECE 203, which is a class that I teach at the graduate level on low power biomedical electronic devices. So lab four will be posted online um, and uh, please take a look at it. Lab four is kind of a long tutorial slash lab. Uh, please don't uh, write a huge report. Um, please only answer the questions that are asked of you in the blue boxes. Uh, and then I'll just end with a summary of the uh, steps that you'll be taking in Lab 4. Uh, and with that, uh, I do highly encourage you to uh, take a look at Lab 4, which again, if, if you are uh, watching this uh, at the time you should be, uh, will be released on Thursday.